just to be a part of that prayer is just to remind me that um, how powerful God's love really is. And how I think, you know, many times we, I don't think we really trust that love. And, some, and sometimes I think our, our greatest struggle is, is that we, we struggle to trust God at all or to trust God with every part of our life. Because, you know, when we talk about resurrection, a lot of times we think of that as this kind of spiritual, abstract uh, kind of card that we get to punch that gets us to heaven and, and, and kind of takes care of things for us. And, and yet, whenever we think about how Jesus lived out his life and his ministry, he said, listen, the kingdom of God is near. The resurrection life is at hand. The living water is available for you. And, and I think it's not just available for certain areas of our life or just parts of who we are, or the parts that we just feel comfortable with, but that that life, that resurrected life is available for every area of our life, that we are able to experience a freedom and a power and a, and a joy that our world just can't understand. And that even, even we, in the mystery of the death and resurrection of Christ, cannot understand and, and truly articulate what God has done for us, what God is doing with us and what God is going to do through us. We are swept up into that mystery, into the power of Christ and into the power of his resurrection. And it's what brings us here. It's what draws us here. It, it's, what, it's what calls us out of this place. It is what defines us and molds us and shapes us. So when we come to talk about stewardship, when we come to talk about the financial realities and the financial resources of our lives, I, I know that so many of us bring an incredible burden into that conversation, an incredible amount of emotion, incredible amount of anxiety, incredible amount of stress and discord uh, that we live out in our hearts and our minds and our families and our relationships um, and our workplaces and in so many areas. And, and, and my hope is, is that we would allow Christ to be the Lord of all of our lives, so that when we come here, we can experience the joy that our neighbors and that our coworkers, that our families and, and our friends do not and cannot experience because they do not know the life and the love of God through Jesus Christ. You know, whenever I started, um, you know, five months ago, whenever I came here, I, I had this whole idea about it, what I thought this stewardship series would be about. And, and if there's one thing that I've learned about God, when you let God in, God just messes with you. And, and sometimes that's the reason some of us like to keep God at a distance because we don't want God to mess with what we've got. And, but the truth of the matter is God's just been messing with me. And, and so to think that two weeks ago I would, you know, we would kind of begin this series together and I would give kind of a financial testimony about you know, my wife and our family and our struggles with debt, our struggles to get our priorities straight in the early years of my ministry to talk about some of the behaviors and attitudes that I brought into money, I brought into being a pastor, I brought into that. Um, I never knew that was going to happen. And then last week to really have a hard conversation about how so many of us struggle with debt in our lives and how so many of us struggle with, with living within our means and, and taking what we have in our hand and using that instead of spending resources that we don't even have by, by credit card debt and by other forms of consumer debt. And, and to realize that God wants us to live in freedom God doesn't want us to feel enslaved to the, to the people and the lenders that we borrow from. That God doesn't want us to find discord and, and strife in our relationships because we can't somehow find this kind of middle ground and, and common goal and, and vision for our financial lives and our families. But that God would want us to come into the sanctuary and sing of, of resurrection and of hope and for that to be true of every area of our life. That we could come in here because we trust God's provision. Now, one of the things is I've kind of had this time over the last couple of weeks, and we've talked about stewardship, not in, not in terms of fundraising, but in terms of, of true discipleship and finding a way to find financial freedom and, and to experience conversion in our life in that area. It's that for me, when I'm really honest with myself, whenever I want to experience freedom in an area of my life, I also have to practice discipline. You know, growing up and, and learning some of the behaviors to be probably a workaholic, somebody who defined himself by the, by the work he did, by how much money he made, and by how good I was at what I did. You know, what I had to learn is I had to learn a different story. 
and that, and that that was not the way I was going to live out my life and not the way I was going to primarily define myself. And so I said, listen, I want to be a great husband and I want to be a great father. And so I said, if I'm going to make those commitments, if I want to have the freedom in my life to be the husband and the father that I need to be, and I needed to take time to do that, then I needed to practice discipline in my time management. I needed to practice discipline in the work that I would do. Because if I would practice that discipline, then I could experience freedom in those areas in my life. If I wanted to be healthy and to play with my children and to have the energy and the physical capacity to chase them and ride bicycles with them and hike with them and, and play soccer with them, then I was going to have to practice discipline in my health and in what I would eat and how I would exercise and how much rest I would get so that if I would practice those disciplines, I could experience a kind of freedom and an opportunity for that in the life of my children and with my family. If I want to be able to give and bring to the table what I have in my hand and to bring um, what God calls me to bring, then I need to practice financial discipline in my life. I need to live within my means. I need to find my center in Christ and not in the materialism that, that so many of us and even myself can get sucked up into so easily in our, in our consumeristic world that we live in. If I want to experience the freedom and to live into the freedom of that love and joy that Christ gives me, then I've got to take time to practice the disciplines of reading scripture, of coming to worship, of celebrating the disciplines and the sacraments, and of finding time for prayer. So that whenever I practice discipline, I am setting myself up and allowing God to create space in my life to live into the freedom that he offers. Sometimes we think that in order to live in freedom, we, have to, we can let all of that go. We can live as we want, by any means we want, however we want. But yet in reality, we know that discipline and freedom go hand in hand. Now that's tough because in our self-help culture, you know, that's, that seems to be a very cerebral practice. It seems to be a very abstract thing that we do in our heads. But when we come to faith and when we come to believe in Jesus Christ and we come forward, we learn that, that these aren't just, you know, mental exercises that we live out. These aren't just abstract principles that we're practicing, but that somehow what we are thinking in our head is connected to our heart. And when we combine the passion and the love that God gives us and we pour our heart and our mind into the same area, God is able to do amazing things. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart shall be. Whenever we set our priorities, when we set what is important to us, then our hearts and our passions will follow, our mind will follow. And, and sometimes we will just unwittingly begin to practice the disciplines that will get us to the place where our passion and where our treasure is. Now in our world, the the, one of the greatest struggles is, is we're kind of double-minded people. You know, one of my friends said, you know, really we live in a soft, secular Christian world where we proclaim Jesus with our mouths and with our songs and our preaching and our prayers, but where we really put our trust is in our material possessions and in our titles and in the things that we hold in our hands. That's the reason we struggle sometimes financially. That's the reason we struggle in our world because we will come to church and we will preach and pray and sing and hallelujah. Yet when we go out of the, into the world, we feel like there's nothing for us to hold on to except what we can purchase, what we can buy, what's bigger, better, or more. And then we get in that vicious cycle of, of purchasing and buying because we want security, because we want definition, because we want identity. And then all of a sudden we realize that none of those things, regardless of how many we buy, regardless of how much we buy regardless of how expensive and, and how much more they're never going to give us what we are created to have and that is identity through Jesus Christ it's never going to be enough only in Christ is what we do sufficient and I think that's sometimes why we struggle in time in terms of of our prayer time in terms of coming to worship regularly in terms of serving in terms of scripture in terms of all those disciplines because that's not really where our heart is our heart and our lives are pointed toward these material things so we will spend time watching TV we will spend time shopping we will spend time doing all of these things of purchasing and buying we will we will define our life by by spending trips we will define our life by what we're able to purchase and how we can decorate and all these things that we can do, yet none of those things will fully give us what we are called and created for to God and Jesus Christ. 
So it's amazing the disciplines that we will practice unknowingly and unwittingly. That's the reason I said, if, you know, the first part when we started this, if you really want to know where your heart is, where your priorities are, two of the great first places to look are in your calendar to see where you're spending your time and how you're spending your time, and the second is your bank account. Where are your time and your funds going? And usually those will betray your true priorities. That will tell you where your heart is. That will tell you what you really treasure in your life. So when we come this morning, you know, we talk about how do we marry together what we have going on in our heads with the passion and the love that God gives us in our heart to do these life-changing and, and world-transforming things. And part of that has to do with the fact of trusting God, of trusting that if you take this path, if you step in this direction, that God will provide what you will need. It's just like the disciples in this story. Here they are, these thousands of people have been following Jesus, and now it's come to the end of the day. And the disciple says, listen, send them home. Send them to the village. Let them go fend for themselves. Let them go figure it out on their own. And Jesus says, no, let's feed them. And he says, where are we going to do it? He says, you feed them. You figure it out. And they said, listen, all we have are five loaves and two fish. You know, sometimes I think that's how we look at our lives. You know, so many of man, we have so much, we have so much stuff. We have so much education. We have so many resources. We have so many relationships. We have so much going for us in our lives. Yet when we come to the table, when we come to the moment and we lift it all up, we just go, wow, look how little we have. Oh, yeah. I don't have two or three cars. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I don't have the resources to put my kids through school. I don't have this much house to live in. I don't have all of these things to have. We come and we say, hey, I've got five loaves and two fish. There's no way that God can use that. We see through eyes of scarcity. We, see, we don't see with eyes of faith. We don't see what God can do with what we are willing to bring in our hand. And so we don't take it to God. We don't bring it to that situation. We leave it behind. We draw it back. We circle it up. We hold it back. But yet God says, here it is. If you will practice the disciplines that can lead you to freedom in these areas of life, you're going to be able to bring time to the table. You're going to be able to bring resources to the table. You're going to be able to bring expertise to the table. You're going to be able to bring all of these things to the table. And because you're going to be able to do that, you are going to experience a freedom and a blessing that you never imagined. You know, just thinking about coming to Thanksgiving and to Christmas. You know, none of us want to be Scrooge. None of us want to be the miser. None of us want to be the ones that everybody looks to and says, oh, there's just no way. I, you know, and I, and I think about that. All of us in our hearts want to give. All of us want to give. All of us want to be generous. We don't wake up in the morning and say, listen, I only want to live by the least. I only want to feel like I have less than everybody else. I only want to bring, you know, the extra that I have. No, I think all of us get up and we say, listen, we want to be there. We want to be at the table. We want to be in the thick of it. We want to be generous in what we give. And I think God says, listen, exactly. Because I created you in my image. And I am a generous giver. In John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever should believe in him should have eternal life and not perish. God is the ultimate generous giver. God gave it all. God laid it all out on the line. And God put in each and every one of us that same desire to give, that same frustration when we're not able to give, when we're not able to live up to where we know and want to be. God put that there because God had placed in us that same DNA, that same spiritual energy to give and to create for God so loved the world that he gave. Love and giving go hand in hand. I can't think of a time whenever I don't see the word love, like in a relationship or in a family, and love doesn't equate giving. To give generously. When you love someone, you give. When you give freely, you love. They are connected. You cannot separate them. And I think that's the story that God tells us here. God says, listen, here, feeding these 5,000, you know what I just realized? I haven't read the scripture yet, have I? I got so excited. Shoot, man. Hey, let's turn in our Bibles here. You ever been so excited you realize you just ran past and then you got to come back and take a moment to do that? Let's, let's just take a moment and read the scripture this morning. 
Luke chapter 9. We're going to change the scripture than having your bullets. And so for all of you A-plus students that already read the scripture and were ready, I'm sorry about that. 10 through 17. I was so excited. It's like going to a Pearl Jam concert. Twice. Twice. I'm trying to dress it up with a cardigan. All right. On their return, the apostles told Jesus all they had done. He took with them and withdrew privately to a city called Bethsaida. When the crowds found out about it, they followed him and he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed to be cured. The day was drawing to a close and the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside to lodge and get provisions, for we are here in a deserted place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men, which probably had been about you know, several thousand women and children along with them. And he said to the disciples, Make them sit down in groups of about 50 each. They did so and made them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples and were filled. Oh, gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate and were filled. What was left over was gathered up 12 baskets of broken pieces. So now that we've read our scripture, we see this, this moment here. When Jesus is, is sharing with these 5,000 men and these several thousand women and children who are probably there, you're talking about 15 to 20,000 people possibly. And it's a story of God meeting the needs of his people. And he's telling the disciples, you have what you have in your hand. Take and you feed them. Don't send them away. And I, as, I, as I read this passage, and as I thought about this morning, and, and getting ready, and I, and I think what got me so excited about it that I was just so ready to jump up here and get going, is because I know that, I, that this is a story from this church. You see, whenever I found out I was moving here, and, and, and going to become the pastor, uh, I started looking through Facebook, I started looking through pictures and emails and things that people had sent me and that I'd already started to get. I began to look on the website and, and before I ever saw a financial report about this church, I knew this was a generous church. Before I ever saw any kind of documentation, saw any kind of spreadsheet or Excel layout or anything like that or budgets or financials or actuals or anything, I knew this was a church that was a generous church because I could tell in the way this church lives out its faith that this is a generous and a loving church. One of the first times I walked in the door, vacation Bible school was going on. And um, I think I have a couple pictures of those. And, and here we had our children here and, and they were celebrating on that day um, how much they, how many, how many resources or how much funds they had raised through lemonade stands and through everything else to be able to provide money for uh, health kits and the relief effort for the tornadoes that had gone on in Texas and in Oklahoma. And that day, I remember they were celebrating, they raised over $1,300 through their efforts to share life and to help with healing and to provide resources for those who had gone through these extreme natural disasters. And I thought to myself, wow, I said, this church really grows up generous people from the ground up. This is what this church does. And then the next thing uh, I saw was a picture because our fourth and fifth graders in our vacation Bible school went out to do service projects. And so they went out to some of our homebound here in Argyle. And this is Mr. Blue. And he's over 90 years old, do we know? 95, you know, so he's seen life. And our fourth and fifth graders went out, and you know, that's love right there. That's generosity, that's giving, that's sharing. And I said, wow, we raise up our kids that way. We raise them up to love and to love on people. And I thought, that's fantastic. And then, and then I saw some of our youth who went on our mission trip to Hugo, Oklahoma, right, Nathan, to the Goodland Academy here. And this is an academy and a school and an orphanage, right, that started off working with Native American children on the reservations and providing opportunity. And I said, man, what can you not ask your youth to do but to love and to care and to share? And, you know, one of the great ways is a great game of kickball, right? This past uh, fall, we also had our women, women's group go to Jamaica to share in an orphanage and ministry there, right? So they went, 10 women went, 
10, that's love and sharing right there, right? I didn't even have to see a financial report to know what kind of church this is. You know, we've talked about Borman and our mentoring program with Borman Elementary, which is uh, the second highest at-risk campus in elementary school in the Denton ISD. We have 11, I think 11 youth signed up for that, 12 adults already signed up. We have 23 people that want to go and mentor and invest life and invest time and invest love in people. You'll see in your bulletins the study buddy program that we have people who want to mentor and there's opportunities to mentor and love on children here at, at Hilltop and Argyle ISD. There's a place for us to do that. And that's the kind of church that we are. That's what we do. That's how we give. That's how we love. That's how we invest. That's what stewardship is. It's not fundraising. It's life giving. Every aspect of our life so that God can do the amazing work that God does. You know, last week we did a step-up chart, and we have over 600 giving units in our church, and, and one of the hardest things to always wrap our minds around is, is kind of not just who gives, or not that we know who gives, but not how many units give certain amounts, but that over 400 of our giving units give $60 or less each month. And people come up to me and they say, Pastor, how do you wrap your mind around that? And I, I say, first of all, I said, people's giving is between them and God. You know, I know there are people in there that are giving faithfully, sacrificially what they can give at this moment. And they said, well, what about the others? And I said, well, I said, in my experience, you know, that's where God is going to be working with them to open up a new life. Because whenever we are able to give, whenever we practice the disciplines, whenever we put our heart and our mind in the right place and we focus on the priorities of Christ, God will make sufficient what we need and what he has gifted us to bring to the table. You know, I had a good friend uh, in Maybank a couple of churches ago. His name was Daryl Drennan. And Daryl was a Navy veteran, and he had um, served in submarines and, and fought and had was just an amazing man, loved to quail hunt. He was just a great guy. And uh, he had physically um, become kind of incapacitated. And I remember one day he called me over to his house, and he said, uh, Pastor, so I just want to tell you how mad I am at you and how upset I am with you. Now, pastors, we have these conversations on a fairly regular basis. You just can't, not make, you just can't make everybody happy. So I said, really, Daryl? I said, now tell me how I've made you so upset and why you're so mad at me. He said, Pastor, he says, every month I get things in the mail wanting me to give. And I want to give. And so I've given to all of those things. He says, but now you've come to the church and now we've started doing all this ministry. Now we've started reaching out. Now we've started making a difference. Now people's lives are being changed. Now I can see our impact that ripples through our community and throughout our world. And he says, now I'm mad at you because now I have to choose. I can't give to everything. So what do you have to say about that? And I said, I said, Daryl, I can't make that decision for you. You've got to prayerfully consider what's important. I just know in my life, I have to distinguish between good things and God things. Because there are plenty of good things to give to. But I know as a person of faith, I have to, I have to choose how I'm going to give to the God things in my life. And that's a decision we all have to make. How are we going to give? What are we going to give to? And how's that going to play itself out in the world? You know, in Acts 20, it says that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And see, what my real hope is, you know, I'm, not, I'm not here trying to raise a budget. I'm not here trying to do all of that. What I want is I want each and every one of you in whatever way is, is, is potentially possible for you to experience the blessing and the freedom that God has for you in your life. I want you to experience a blessing. I want you to experience the joy of giving, of being able to give to the extent to which it brings joy and peace and hope into your life, to be able to see you know, those kind of pictures and lives being changed and be able to say, listen, God called me. I brought my five loaves and my two fish. I didn't think it was enough, but I stepped out in faith. I gave it and God made it enough. In scripture, it says that God loves a joyful giver. And you know what I love about that word joyful, that we translate that way, it's also the root word for the word hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver. God loves people that give in such a way that people look at them and go, they must be crazy because of how generous they are, because of how much time they invest, because how they live their lives, because somehow they're giving beyond what is socially acceptable. You see, I don't want you to give and to live a life that is socially acceptable. I want you to live and give in a way that honors Christ and that is kingdom-filled and that other people will look at and go, what in the world is my neighbor doing? 
Why do they live that way? Why do they give that way? Why do they love that way? I can't do that. I don't know how. What, why do they experience that joy in their life? What's up with that church down the road? Who do they think they are living and loving and giving like that? What, that's just that's terrible. They must be out of their minds. They must be crazy. That stuff, that isn't the way a church is supposed to operate. That isn't the way people in, a, in this area are supposed to live. That's not how they're supposed to love. I want us to look up and stand up and say, listen, we're a church of Jesus Christ. We're going to give like our God gave. And because we're going to give like our God gave, God is going to take what we give and do amazing things that are going to point to him and not to us. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, just, I just know this is the kind of church we are. I know this is the kind of church we want to be. I know this is the kind of church you want to be a part of. And it's the kind of church you've been growing. And thank God, I thank God every day that I've woken up and, and been a part of this congregation over the last five months. And I want you to experience that joy. I want you to know that peace. I want you to live in that hope. And today you get to take a step in that. I hope that for our members and our regular attenders, people who call this, you know, our church home, I, I just hope I have prayed for you all this week as you and your families have made these decisions because I want you and your families to experience freedom. I want y'all to know the hope and the joy and the peace that comes from practicing the disciplines that lead you to this place. If you're a guest with us this morning, you know, I pray for you too. I, I know you're searching for a spiritual home. You're searching for a place to connect and, and, and to give your life and to find life and hope for you and your family in return. And let me tell you what, I, I don't know about other congregations here, but I, if this is a place where you want to be a part of that, we are definitely on that journey and you're always more than welcome to be a part of it with us. And all I ask is that you pray for us as we, as we, as we try to listen and trust and follow Christ in the direction and in the place in which he wants us to go. So that the pictures that I showed up here this morning, that's just scratching the surface of what God's going to do at this church. Can I have a moment of prayer with us? Let's pray. God, we thank you <laughs> that you love us. We thank you, God, that you give so generously to us. And God, we thank you that you have hardwired into our souls the longing to be generous to we confess, God, that there are so many things externally and internally that work against us living into that type of generous loving and generous giving. God, we pray that as a church and as a community, God, that as we tap into your life and love, God, that you will give us the courage to take one step closer to you and to trust you in our giving, to trust you in our loving, and to trust, God, that you will provide for every need that we have. It is in that hope, it is in that love that